All right, you are good to go, Kathy. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is the Joint Capital Planning Committee meeting. Um, and I, um, I am the chair, Kathy Shane, if we have outside listeners and pursuant to the governor's orders, we're conducting this virtually. And I'm going to go around just to make sure everyone can see can hear and be heard. And I just wanna, I think everyone knows we are recording these. Um, so you'll be able to see them later. And I think I'll just do it in order of, um, I'm just gonna call out the committee member names for the time being. Um, so Carrie. Present. Tammy. Present. Peter. Present. Mandy. Present. And Alex. Here. Okay, so we're missing one member, Andy, and I have to ask whether we have any um, willing volunteers to take minutes. Um, Peter, thank you. And one of the things I mentioned just before, I'm not sure whether you were already on, is if we can post the videos quickly, you know, the minutes can be um, summaries of what we've done, you know, and referring to the documents we were looking at, because people can always go and hear the discussion. So Sean, I think I will turn the, um, the uh, order over to you so you can invite the first person to present. And we are gonna be timing the presentations so that we can get through a long list tonight. And Sean will just let someone know if they're going long. Otherwise, you should feel comfortable that you have plenty of time. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. So um, I've let all the speakers tonight give them a general um, time to use to present the projects that are, they're proposing um, so that we can have plenty of time for questions. And I'll just give a little caution if we start running over the allotted time by too much, um, just to make sure that we can get everybody in um, tonight that's that's coming. So uh, the first speaker is Sua Adet, our recently anointed or sworn in, sworn in. I love anointed, oh. <laughs> appointed. Um, so Sue, you can um, take it away. And I don't know, does the group want me to bring up the project justifications as we talk through them or just only if they're requested? Um, I, I don't know whether, every, did everyone get a chance to see um, the postings? So, so I'll just bring them up if there's a question. Um, otherwise, okay. just let Sue go ahead and present it. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great, okay. Well, Good evening, everyone. Um, so the town clerk's office, I'm going to be reading straight ahead. So if I'm not looking at you because I got my script here. The town clerk's office is requesting approval for the purchase of new voting equipment for fiscal year 2022. There are two main reasons why voting equipment is necessary at this time. The most important of which is the future possible implementation of ranked choice voting for town elections. Section 10.10 .10 of the town charter calls for the creation of a ranked choice voting commission and the charge of which was adopted on December 10th, 2018. In researching the voting equipment that would be able to tabulate a ranked choice ballot, the commission determined that the town's current voting equipment would not be able to tabulate results in this manner. The four major criteria used in evaluating potential voting equipment was functionality, security, auditability, and usability. The chosen equipment would have to also be on the Secretary of State's list of approved voting equipment. After extensive research in their final report to the town council on December 1st, 2020, the Ranked Choice Voting Commission recommended the image cast tabulator with election night reporting software and hardware as the best option to suit the needs for both ranked choice voting and non-ranked choice voting. The town council approved this recommendation and forwarded legislation, which was filed on February 19th, 2021, just a couple of days ago. If passed before July 5th, 2021, based on the language in this bill, we would need to implement ranked choice voting for the upcoming November 2nd, 2021 town election, which is going to require the new tabulators. The quote of $80,300 received from LHS Associates includes 14 tabulator bundles, which is one per precinct with four spare units, the reporting software and hardware, a two-year hardware software warranty, documentation including testing guides, poll worker training guides, and an instruction to voter poster, 
Two training sessions are also included, a two-hour session for town clerk staff and a two-hour session for poll workers, all in the town of Amherst. Also included is on-site coverage by an LHS employee for our first election, beginning one hour prior to the polls opening and ending two hours after the polls close. The second reason for the need of new voting equipment is the age of our current equipment. This equipment was purchased in early 2001, making it 20 years old. The estimated life expectancy of this type of equipment is about 10 to 15 years. We're already well past the current life expectancy. And in fact, we've experienced more frequent repairs and breakdowns during elections over the last few years. The vendor has also discontinued this model so parts are now becoming harder to obtain. So that's pretty much it. Um, the two major reasons why we need voting, new voting equipment, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you. So I'm, I'm looking around. Um, may, maybe just raise your hand so I don't have to also pull the screen up. Mandy's hand is up. I doesn't actually have questions. I just want to congratulate Sue for her appointment to town clerk and also say what you just said answered the questions I did have, which is why I don't have questions. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, I have two, um, not so much about the purchase, you know, the need for it. One would be if we're going to try for the November second election to use these. And um, we're, we've got this reserve fund that we're allocating, this is for Sean, to this coming year. Would it make any sense to buy them sooner rather than waiting to July so we could be tra training? So that, it's just a question, is the timing? And then is there any grant money? You said maybe grant money in, in the write-up, and those were my two questions. Um, the sooner, well, July, it's now February, it's almost March. You know, it wouldn't be all, it, I think July would be soon enough. Okay. Fiscal year 2022, but in um, the grant money, Sean, I know that new grant money was made available, but um, I don't, yeah, I don't know if this would fall under that. Yeah, well, I mean, we so we've used the CARES Act to do some of the upgrades for the town clerk's office for the, the past cycle, um, the things that were eligible. I'm not sure if voting machines would be eligible if, if, we're, if you're talking about the CARES Act, Sue, um, but it's certainly something we can check. I just, I don't, I don't know if those machines in themselves, because we would, usually things that were slated to be replaced anyway, they're not going to cover because we were supposed to replace them. Um, but we'll definitely check. And I, I just was also asking, I think it came up at the council that whether there is any money at the state level when towns voting equipment is falling apart. Is there any support for buying new or is that always the mun on municipal budget? That, you know, so I have, no, I have no reason to think there is, but it was a question, yeah. I don't think there is. I was looking through files the other day to see if I could find anything. I found nothing. Um, it's certainly worth asking on the state level though, which I could do. Okay. Any other questions? So I, okay, I think that's great. I think we can, move on to the next presentation, Sean. Well, we are making great time. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank uh, you. Uh, so the next department is Jeremiah's um, and Rob is here as well if he wants to join in um, and it's gonna be town facilities. So Jeremiah, just give an overview and then walk us through each of the, um, the FY22 projects. And you're muted still. I can't, is, I'm not hearing him. Yeah, we, uh, now we can hear you, Jeremiah, you're good. Okay, all right, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so what I did is I, I ended up, uh, I know Sean and I spoke with you earlier and, and asked if I needed to put something together, but I went ahead and put a visual together. It just is gonna help me with you know, uh, my thoughts and putting it all together. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to screen share and go through each of the projects. So Sean, can you give him the ability to the screen share? Yeah. Let me 
just try to move some things around. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay. So this is my facilities department PowerPoint. So one of the first uh, uh, items that was requested was for the police station, some interior maintenance. Uh, in the photo, you can see this is the, the report writing room of the police department. Uh, another room that is included in this request is the operations center. Um, as you can see, these spaces are very widely used. Uh, officers are in here every day. It might be just a, a few conversations catching up. I think they do a handoff uh, from one shift to another, uh, but a bulk of their reporting is done in this space. So the request is to uh, get rid of some of these built-in worn out cabinet trees as shelving and countertops and, and sort of make it a, a space that, that's more conducive for their, their work that they do, that productivity and, and provide a little bit of comfort because their officers do uh, spend a fair bit of time in here. Uh, just behind where I was taking this photo is their library. So that's another space within this room uh, that they provide a, a, quite a bit of work. Um, the next is just showing you some of these existing conditions. So the countertop is an older Formica countertop. You can see some damage uh, to that and the cabinetry on the right hand side, you can see some damage there. And, and I, I will have to say that in, in a lot of this, I'm sort of highlighting, I, I'm highlighting some of the, the, the more um, uh, worn areas. Uh, but in general, you can see that the space is, is used um, quite a bit uh, and really does need um, some improvements. So this first request was for $25,000 and this would help with um, replacing all that cabinetry and countertops, uh, getting some furniture in there and really just kind of uh, um, sort of rebuilding this space that, that these officers need. Any questions about this one? You want me to just uh, go through each or? Um, yeah, I think um, I'm trying to figure out, I guess I can hide the screen and look at the hands. So if, would people prefer going through everything and then just asking questions? Yes, I, I'm seeing a nod of head. So yes, go through and then to the extent there are questions, we'll focus on those. Okay. Okay, and the next one is the chiller replacement at the uh, uh, Amherst Police Department. So this is a project that I've asked Sean to move forward. Uh, initially, we had the roof as one of our larger projects uh, for this year, uh, but I felt that the, the roof could be delayed, uh, but the chiller could not. So the chiller is original to the building um, and it was manufactured, I have uh, uh, the placard for it, it was manufactured in 1989. Uh, this chiller is well beyond its ASHRAE standard of service life. Uh, typically, we're going to see about 20 years out of a piece of equipment like that, and 89 to 21 is, is uh, beyond 20 years. And it, and it has served us, it, it owes us nothing. Uh, in these past years, we had experienced a catastrophic failure. Um, in this photo here, you could see the tube sheet. So that tube sheet had a rupture in it and it rendered that chiller useless. We were unable to cool the building. Uh, I, I know Rob, uh, working with some local vendors, was able to get a replacement tube sheet and they, were, they, they got that chiller back online. Um, this, this is going to be a big project, uh, not only looking at it and saying, are we going to replace this chiller with like kind, or is there opportunities uh, to look at the building and, and uh, maybe change the equipment that helps support our energy and our carbon footprint goals for the town? I, the request is for $400,000. Um, depending on what we do, I, I would have to think that it would only go up. So if we were to look at a full VRF system for that building, 
um, which would be the most energy efficient uh, and probably the best for most modern and with the most controls would also come with the highest price tag. Uh, so that 400,000 would, would more than likely just get us new equipment that would be much more efficient, uh, but, but replacing it with a light, with light kind. Um, it is a hydronic system so we do have a two pipe system. So there's a feed water going out to the field and then that feed water is coming back. That two pipe system is being shared with both the boilers and the, the chiller. Uh, one of the things that I did notice about the system over at the uh, uh, police department was there is a shot feeder for chemicals. And, and I did notice that, that we didn't have a water treatment system um, for the building. So when you're, heating, when you're heating up water or you're cooling water, it changes the water. So the higher you heat those waters, you start to sort of agitate those minerals and metals within the water. And those, those minerals and metals will attack the equipment. So you could have scale that's built up in all of the smaller equipment, the fan coil units, the air handlers, or you can have uh, that buildup that happens in the boilers or in the chiller. Uh, and in seeing that, and then here in this history that we replaced the, the heating boilers uh, not too long ago, and then we had a catastrophic failure in, in the chiller, just led me to believe that it's, it's extremely important that we also uh, close the loop and have this water treatment system uh, program in place. Um, since me coming aboard, I ensured that the building is, it has an adequate water treatment system and that will help extend the life uh, of the system. So we do have beautiful new heating boilers and now the request is to replace that chiller so that we have a, a good operating HVAC system over at the police department. Okay. And have some other pictures. So this is what the chiller looks like in the room. And if you could read that year bill, it does say 1989. <laughs> okay, moving on to the Bangs Community Center, it's replacing flooring. So the request is for $50,000 to, to continue to uh, update the flooring throughout the, the building. Okay, so the Bangs Community Center is the home to the Senior Center, the Public Health Department, and Musanti Health Center. Uh, the facility is widely used for senior programming, community outreach, and for private and public meetings. So this is one of the examples where we, we looked at the floor and we were able to take care of uh, some issues. Um, this is the hall leading into the pole room uh, that was replaced with this engineered wood flooring. Uh, to the lower side of that, that image is a commercial sheet vinyl. After so many years, that commercial sheet vinyl will start to delaminate and come away from the concrete. It will buckle and it creates tripping hazards. Okay. So I have a few other examples of some of the various floors within the building. So all the way to the left is on the first floor where the senior center is. It's a, a smaller four by four tile that we see has a lot of cracking uh, through there. Uh, luckily, it's still secure on the underlayment, uh, but will continue to crumble and that, that will ca be cause for concern. Because obviously, we don't want any, anyone to, to take a tumble. Uh, that middle image is that sheet vinyl, um, and that's in front of the elevator there. So once it starts breaking away, it'll continue to, to break away and, and uh, something that needs to be addressed. Now, really, the only way to repair that, and it is very short term, is to try to cut out a, a big section of it. And hopefully that you could get enough adhesion in that area um, it, to, to keep, keep for a safe transition. And then the last photo all the way to the right, it really doesn't look like there's anything wrong here, um, but this is something that we also need to, to consider. So this is room 101. We have a sheet vinyl in this lower half of the, the image, a transition strip, and then a carpet. So that, that's just a, a, a 
cut pile, uh, normal commercial grade carpet. This room is used for meetings, but it's also used for senior center programming. What concerns me about seeing a space like this with these two different floors is that when you, when you have seniors using spaces, oftentimes their ambulation starts to decline and they don't lift their feet as high. Having these transition strips in the room makes it much more difficult for them to ambulate through the room. Another issue is having a hard surface that transitions onto a carpet surface. Oftentimes, if you have wet feet, when you're coming, going from one type of flooring to another, it, you tend to have, can cause um, some falls from that. So just kind of considering the space, what it's being used for, it should have an appropriate floor that supports that programming. So this is another area that I would like to see changed, really help with the senior center, help with that space and, and really keep everyone safe. Okay. Uh, next is all buildings, interior and exterior maintenance. Uh, the capital request for this is $200,000 and it's for general ongoing repairs needed to town buildings to ensure the facilities are adequately maintained while implementing improvement, improvement strategies that are consistent with the town's energy carbon footprint and accessibility goals. Um, so some of the different areas where this could be used would be, be repairs to walls, ceilings, floors, and office space, and also public facing uh, areas, uh, repairs and replacement of electrical, plumbing, and HVAC fixtures, uh, maintain exterior building envelopes, including masonry, roofing, doors, windows, repair or replace building grounds, grounds including sidewalks, stairways, walkways, handrails, and, and lighting. So this is a, an example of uh, a building envelope uh, issue. Um, this is the town hall. It's the uh, four inch uh, granite uh, fascia that's on part of the building. Uh, I would have to say that you know, the town hall in all uh, is, is looking good, the envelope, uh, but there are some areas that definitely need to be addressed. Uh, this area could use some repointing uh, down in the lower left-hand side. You can see some vegetation starting to grow. Um, all of these things start to uh, push on that, that, um, that masonry on that mortar, pushing it out allows for water infiltration and then causes greater damage. I have uh, several different uh, examples. So on the left-hand side, that is in the, the locker room over at the Amherst Police Department. Uh, it's just uh, some uh, dimensional lumber that was put in there and finished. Um, I have had uh, uh, several officers tell me that something needs to be done because they've uh, got some slivers on their hind sides. So. Uh, looking at some smaller things. So there's big things, there's little things, but there's certainly a lot of things that can be done. Um, there's also an example here of a walkway where we have that, that uh, concrete that's crumbling. Uh, it is New England. We do have all that winter weather. We need to ensure that, that the public and, and, and uh, our, the town employees are safe. Uh, so we are treating all those sidewalks. And over time, it really does affect the integrity of the concrete. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see some water damage or that's caused uh, the, the wood to rot. This is around a window and above it, you can, you can see that there's, there's some uh, repointing that's needed. So again, we see this water infiltrate in these smaller areas and it just translates down the building. Uh, in the middle photo, so, Again, smaller projects. So we're going from big projects to sort of smaller projects where we could use this money to enhance. We have the Bangs Community Center. We have all these windows that are facing uh, the sun, gets a lot of thermal uh, energy that passes through. Sometimes that's great. Sometimes that's not so great. Uh, but, but we're starting to see uh, in those windows some cloudiness. Uh, 
so the gaskets of the windows are starting to break down and, and that reduces efficiency. Also replacing some of those blinds, uh, we, there's, there's a lot of options out there that could help us control the climate within uh, to keep everyone comfortable. Um, and lastly, on the right hand side, there's a small corner uh, of some block there that, that could use uh, repointing and, and possibly resetting, uh, depending on, on the, the extent of, of the work that's needed. Jeremiah, can I add one thing real quick? Sure. So the, the new thing that we also added to that bucket of money this year are accessibility improvements. Um, they're not identified yet because we're still sort of going through the, the report that we got and, and determining what are the, the first ones that would be tackled. Um, but that bucket of money would also be used for those, some of those improvements. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's quite a, as Sean says, there's quite a, there's quite a bit in, in each facility. I, I, you can run a report on say bangs and it's nearly 200 pages long. And it, it, it goes into a great amount of detail with images and, and such, not to say that there's, you know, a lot that's, that needs to be addressed, but it, they're really comprehensive reports. Uh, the next project is town hall security. Uh, the request is for $15,000. And this is to continue the efforts on, on expanding the building access system. Uh, what it would do is it would in, we would be able to install the RFID uh, badge readers to uh, more, more of the doors throughout town hall and all of the uh, associated hardware that's needed for those. Um, some of the, the, the need for that is, for one, it just offers a, a much greater ease of access for town employees, uh, but we also can help control and tailor each one of those, each individual's badge access so that they can get into all of the spaces they need to. And if there's areas that are, that are, that are, uh, not supposed to, they're not supposed to have access to, we can also control that as well. Uh, and I will have to say with, with all that we're dealing with right now with the pandemic, it also helps us if there was ever a need for um, uh, contact tracing. So there's the, these extra uh, that are the help. So it is $15,000, but, it, but it's not cheap because we are replacing hardware as well as this software uh, that we're expanding on. In the image, we're seeing a mechanical uh, handset. Uh, right now, it's, there, there's a lot of issues that can go wrong with these mechanical handsets. Um, for one, it's coding or key access. So you have these codes. There's always the off chance that, that someone could, or someone that shouldn't know that the code could gain access to the building. Is it unlikely? It's less likely, but, but there is still a possibility. By using the badge access system, it, sh it would eliminate that. If a card was to go missing, we could deactivate that card immediately. If, if a, a, a staff member moved on, we could, we can, eliminate that immediately. Or if we needed to grant temporary access to an auditor, say that's coming to meet Sean, uh, and, and we could give them a temporary badge and we can tailor their access for certain days of the week and certain times of the day. Uh, so there's, there's great benefit uh, to the system. Um, we've done so much with it and, and I'd really like to continue that. Uh, most of the doors on the inside of town hall have been uh, addressed and have, have the, the building access system, but we still need to finish out the project and look at the exterior of the building. So that's my example. And then we have the Munson Memorial Library uh, heating and, and cooling system. So uh, the building was built in 1920. I, the furnace was not from the 20s. 
but yeah, I think that shade of brown probably came much later. Uh, and the last major renovation was in 2008, and that was to the HVAC system. So in this image, at the top of the furnace, you can see the ductwork there. That ductwork is, is shiny in 2008 new, uh, but the furnace below is, is much older. Uh, so the, the, the Munson Memorial Library has two oil fire furnaces. One's conditioning the space of the library and the other furnace is conditioning the space of the main hall in the basement area. Uh, and it's, they're starting to uh, have more and more issues. Um, they're not very efficient uh, given their age, uh, but for the most part, they're, they run well enough. Um, I'm happy and I'm happy that they do have some modern components. Uh, Beckett burners are, have been in place for probably the last 40 years or, or more. They do have that. So we still are able to maintain them, uh, but their efficiency is extremely low. Uh, we do have a number of challenges for the hall. Um, it's, it's difficult to, to heat and cool that, that large space. And it also, with the way that the, the system is ducked, we don't have a, a lot of control on it. So it's, it's sort of an all or nothing. So the heat or the cooling that we're providing the main hall upstairs, we're also providing the downstairs. Uh, so that, that area really should be uh, heated or cooled in a different manner. Um, it it's, doesn't require the same uh, BTU output that the main hall does. So with, with replacement of these furnaces, we'd be able to control those spaces better. We'd be able to reduce our, our fuel expenses uh, and just create a better uh, energy efficient building. Uh, there is other projects that should be done and, and it would be nice to have done uh, conjointly, uh, looking at insulation and, and windows and such, uh, because even putting a high efficiency furnace in, in a building, if, if we do have a lot of air leakage or, or, or air penetration from the outside in, it will affect some of that, that efficiency. Okay, so it, this is a $30,000 request, but this $30,000 request is to, to be uh, uh, combined with uh, earlier requests for, for um, funds to replace this heating and cooling system. Uh, what I would like to see here, since this building is so, so widely used, it's always a, it's always a busy building, is to, to, to put a VRF system in here. If I could, it would be best to put a VRF system, um, but that $30,000 wouldn't go very far. And me just estimating the cost of a VRF system for that building would probably be in the tune of, of, of 150. All right. So we do have other funds uh, that, that were requested and, and really this money is to, to combine that so that we can put the proper heating and cooling system in, that, in this facility to be able to manage it um, and monitor th this space. Okay, and I have another photo. Here's the other furnace. Looks like a Sherman tank, still runs, um, but it's not very efficient. So this unit, if you, if you were to see the return on it, so the heat, the, the, the heat registers are going up very high up into the hall and coming from one side. The return for this uh, furnace is underneath the stage. And, it, and it's, it's like a modified closet. So it's a, it's a plenum style return you, you could walk in. So it, it would be more efficient if it was ducted straight into the furnace. Um, but I don't know that it's possible to make those changes with this old antiquated equipment. Sean, I promise you this isn't my lawnmower, but I found this image and I had to use it. <laughs> uh, so the last request is for $15,000 and it's to replace some of our grounds and landscape equipment uh, for the buildings. 
we do have quite a bit of, of equipment, we, but we also have quite a bit of, of building and grounds. Um, looking back at the last building was Munson and, and Munson has a, a, a nice big yard and a lot of beautiful trees in there. And, and, I, and I will say it, 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 it creates a, a lot of work uh, for the staff in the fall season. And I, and I do wanna thank uh, uh, Guilford and his team for assisting with that. Um, but we certainly could use some, some additional equipment. We have some small equipment at uh, Town Hall and Bangs Police Department. Uh, but at this point, this, for this season, I've sp spent nearly $1,000 just repairing some of the equipment that I have. And that was just for the snow removal um, uh, season. Uh, so the, the, the equipment is getting old. Um, we do have uh, a mixture of gas and also battery op uh, options. Because uh, again, we, we, we're trying to do our best to eliminate some of the, the older equipment and, and get some of these newer, the new technology, some of the battery operated uh, uh, devices. But in some instances, the amount of area that we need to service is just too large uh, for some of the battery operated options. Um, so the, the intent with the money is to replace equipment that is aged and is now uh, needing uh, extensive repair. Um, I do follow how much we are spending on the equipment because you know, when we have say a snow thrower at, at Munson that was purchased uh, in 2004, you know, we, you have to start to consider how much we're putting into vice, how much it would be to replace it. Um, so that would be the request is to replace some of that equipment. And I think that's it. I know Sean that you put in that $50,000 request Quest for sustainability. I don't have a slide for that. Or... Yeah, so um, I emailed the group before. I think what I'd like to do is um, we'll talk about that one when conservation presents their pro uh, projects and Dave is here and we'll have a, a write up for that one. Okay. So that's it, if anyone has any questions. Okay, I'm looking at, um, you can put hands up if you would like to. I'm looking around the room. Mandy. I'm gonna try and let someone else go first. <laughs> but um, um, a, a number of questions, some of which I came in with and some of which raised in my mind as you spoke. Um, so I'll start with the ones that came up as you were presenting. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, the the police department chiller, um, you know, and 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 it goes to that also to the Munson HVAC in a sense. You know, we're trying to move off of fossil fuels, and my assumption is these chillers and HVAC systems are going to last 20, 30, 40 years up towards about the time where we have a climate action goal of being completely off fossil fuels. Um, and so when we're putting these in. Um, what's the additional cost to try and put something in, or is it still possible to put something in that doesn't run off of fossil fuels, especially for a chiller? I know there's a lot more of, you know, um, air sourced pumps that do air conditioning better than heating, at least in, in New England. Um, you know, and so you talked about that with the chiller at the police department, what would that estimated cost be um, for more sustainability? And for Munson, um, is there a way to do it? And, and if so, what do we know what that cost is or what would you know you talked about a, the vrf system how much more would that be and could we somehow find funds for that those yes. are my questions, and then i got more <laughs> yeah so the 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 chiller if we were to look at a, a chiller you can you could replace it with an electric absorb or electric uh centrifugal chiller so it wouldn't be running off of a fossil fuel uh, and it would be uh, um, electric rather than say like an absorption chiller that would run off a of natural gas. Mm -hmm. um, so there are electric options. Um, if we were to, if we were to compare uh, uh, an electric centrifugal 
chiller versus a large VRF system, I would have to guess that the VRF system for one would, would offer so much more control uh, than, than this chiller because you're, you're, what, what a VRF system would allow for is you, you would be able to heat and cool spaces simultaneous, simultaneously with the two pipe chillers, uh, chiller and heating or the hydronic system, you're doing really one or the other. So if it was a four pipe system, that means every fan coil unit, every air handler has two coils in it so that you could run chilled, chilled water or refrigerant through it, or you could do a, like a heated water, superheated water, uh, but we don't have those abilities. So it is really one or the other. Uh, so the, you know, the maintenance staff have to go downstairs and flip the, the magical switch and we, we transition over into heating or cooling season. So yes, that VRS system is wonderful. Um, it would allow us to uh, do both simultaneously. It also can sense uh, if, if one room is, is warm and another room is cool and what it could do is pull heat from this one space and transfer that heat over to the, the, the area that's cool and, and vice versa. So they they are they are really incredible systems i i i think if we were to go a full vrf and i'm just you know i i actually think about this stuff and i go well what is the equipment going to look like where would it be housed uh in my experience a lot of vrf systems are on rooftops uh, so you would have this giant box up there that looks like a rooftop unit that you would see if you were able to look across some of the tops of the buildings. Uh, so it could be six or eight feet wide and, and that tall and 12 feet long. And beside that, now you have condensers. That takes up a lot, a lot of space. And that's being, that space is being taken up on a big flat roof that is something that the police department does not have. Uh, so, so how would we put that down, down on the ground? Because really that's our only option. If we were eliminating the chiller and we were eliminating the condenser, well, where the footprint of the condenser is, that would offer a space to put other systems. Uh, so I, I, by no means am I a, a, an engineer, but you know, it's, I try to think about some of the different equipment. Um, there are options. So there are options to get away from fossil fuels for the, for, uh, the police department. And there are good options and then great options. And I would say that the great option is the VRF system. It's, it should be a little bit more challenging. Uh, for Munson, uh, the VRS system is the air source heat pump system. So it's basically just a multi-split system. So you'd have um, some device. So it could be actually, you could pull that furnace out and put essentially a box with an A-frame in there. So in that, in that A-frame, you're just sending a, um, a refrigerant through it. And there's a and there's a fan, so it's it's similar to like an air conditioning system. You have the condenser outside, and it's either doing the heating or the cooling. So that would be a pretty low cost way of getting into air source heat pumps for Munson. Uh, the, a better way, a more efficient way, would be is if you had uh, actual fans within the building. So if you've been into some may, maybe doctor's spaces, you see up on the wall they have this cassette that blows that, that air around. They do have other options that, that could go into the ceiling. They're a lot more sleek looking and they're able to uh, send the air out a little bit better than I, I would say than the wall units. Um, so those are options there. I started looking at that for both Munson and North Amherst uh, School just to see um, what, what the cost was so I was able to get a design design uh, and a cost estimate for North Amherst, um, but still, based on that, I'm kind of looking. Okay, what did they what, what did they recommend for North Amherst, and so what what would it cost for Munson? Um, so I think that there there certainly is options for Munson, and I would like to explore that because we do have uh, those those goals for the town and. 
I know that Rob and I have talked about some of the other projects and we've said, well, if we, we stick with a fossil fuel and it is super energy efficient, are we doing enough or, or could we do more? And, and it, if we need to do more, then it would push us into these other systems. Uh, so and, I, I just want to, can I follow up? On, I, I had the same question, Mandy, but uh, when you were talking about the 30,000 for Munson, you yeah. said you have additional money yes. and that um, I thought you said the total system you might want was a uh, 150. So my question is, do you have the other 120, you know, so, you know, so it was, I wasn't quite sure how much we have and how much of what you just described is within at Munson. Um, so I, 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 Rob might be able to answer this too. I believe that we have 90 additional and there might be some others, other money that's out there. So we have this 30 request, a 90 um, that, that's already there. And I, there might be a little bit. And again, I think that the 150 is just, it, it really is just an estimate, estimate based on what I saw at North Amherst School. And there are options to bring down that cost just by the, the system that you choose. Um, and that 150 would probably be having the cassettes everywhere that would be supplying that heating and cooling <coughs> one of those spaces. Uh, by replacing the, the furnace with a uh, heat pump system and using the existing ductwork, you could reduce that cost quite a bit. That might be an option over at the library side, even though that ductwork isn't the best because some of the registers come up right next to counters or sort of behind or near a bookcase where it's, it, it, it doesn't support the space very well, but it could be done. So how close would we get there? Well, we would be off of fossil fuels. We would have a super energy efficient system but we wouldn't, we wouldn't maximize how efficient it is unless we went full VRF. So I guess that clears up my question. When you're talking VRF, that is completely off of fossil fuels then? Completely off of fossil okay. fuels. It's basically, it's, a, it's like we know is like a mini split. Yeah. It's just a multi-split. So, so it's essentially you have a junction box. So you have your condenser outside, you have a junction box and that goes to say six units rather than one, one condenser outside going to one unit inside. So it's just a bit bigger, bigger system. And they usually have uh, like uh, economizers in the system. So it again, helps with efficiency. Alex. Manny, Joe, I know you have more questions, but mine is related. No, go, go Alex. My questions are, all my other questions are related to out projects, not this year. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so it's my understanding that the ECAC committee is looking at replacing all of the HVAC systems through municipal buildings, or they're creating some kind of recommendation around that, um, to get us toward our carbon neutrality goal in 2050. And I'm curious how these projects interrelate to that. And I don't know whether you're like my husband and everything always sounds like it's okay, even when it's not, or like, I didn't feel any panic in your presentation. I felt like I could kick these things down the road. And I don't know if that's your personality <laughs> or whether that's the real state of things. So I'm, I'm curious um, because getting off fossil fuels is like this much of the piece of getting toward carbon neutrality, right? It's all about how energy efficient the buildings are, how efficient the systems, the plug loads. I mean, there's there's like way more to getting to yeah. um, that carbon neutrality goal. And so I guess my convoluted question that I'm trying to figure out is, do we have a bigger plan coming from ECAC that may or may not mesh with this? Might there be grant funds that we're applying to replace these systems? And if we're looking at the cheaper systems that aren't VRF, are they really getting us to that ultimate goal that we as a town say that we have around sustainability. And are you the right person to answer those questions? I don't know, <laughs> maybe it's Paul, I don't know. I mean, it's Sean, I don't know who that is. Yeah, so there might be some information there that I'm not 
aware of. I don't, I don't know if it, Rob or Sean has any information on that. So I'll say one thing and then other people can hop in. Um, one of the things we'll talk about with the sustainability improvement money is for things like this, where if we are a little bit short on a project to get it to that next tier of where we want it to be, to be like the VRF system, that's one of the things we would hope to use that money for. Um, so like in the case of the months and, you know, when we get bids in, if, if between the old article and um, the new money, if that gets approved and we're a little bit short, we would look to that sustainability project to get us enough to do that, do the full project that um, Jeremiah was talking about. And, and just to add on, we have not seen the report from the ECAC committee, so I'm not sure what they're recommending. And I guess the follow up maybe for you, um, Jeremiah, is I mean, again, like these felt like good to do items, but not necessarily. I mean, we've got a lot of we have a lot of municipal buildings with systems that are from the 1990s and and like that's not a new thing for us. That's kind of the big the bigger issue we're dealing with as a town. So for me, I mean, I'm looking at our capital budget, like we're not going to be up to a high capital budget this year. We're sort of in this interim step this year of really sort of watching our pennies. And so um, I guess I, I'm trying to gauge from your presentation what really was a, we really need to deal with this this year versus it would be good to deal with it um, type proposals. Um, and, I, and I heard a lot of uh, things that sounded like buckets of money to deal with things that would be good to versus things we have to. And again, that could be completely presentation style and your mellow personality and nothing to do with actual, you know, high priority needs. So I'm just trying to sort of parse out if we don't have enough money to spend. Um, I, I don't want to recommend that like we don't go forward with something because I didn't fully understand the how, how important the need was. So I mean, I guess of the projects, I mean, are they all more pressing than they sounded to me or? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> the police department, yeah. The police I mean, department. Like most of the projects are like, the oh, facility. Like them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to stay calm. <laughs> so the police department is a, is a building that, that we know is a 24 hour facility. Um, and and it, it always has a, a quite a few people in it. Um, that, that is probably one of the things that concerns me the most uh, is that, that chiller. Uh, and part, part of it is, is just the scale of the replacement. It, it's, not, it's not easy. Uh, I replaced a, a 600 ton absorption chiller, uh, but that was on the outside of a building and it was still a big project. This one's in the basement of the building. So looking at how we're gonna bring a new system into the building and, and get it set or decommission the old one and get it out of the building. Uh, and then you have all of the systems that are out, outside of the building and then, then all the connecting pipe. So, so there's, there's a lot that, that we have to look at. Is any of it sal salvageable or does it all have to go? Um, so it's the scale of that, the PD's uh, chiller that, that is probably more concerning. Um, Munson, it, there, there is a need. I, the, the boilers and the furnaces are, are very, very old. And, and I joke, I, I wish, you know, you could find a, a, that battleship or all of army drab furnace, but you just can't anymore. Uh, 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 but but they, they certainly do need to get, get replaced. Uh, I have a follow-up on that. Yeah. Uh, Beyond the fact that when I moved to Amherst, the house I lived in had an army drab <laughs> boiler oil burner and we, we worked with our landlord to get it replaced. But um, the upper limit on a VRF system for the uh, police station, I mean, you said you've, we, the request is for 400,000. What, what additional would be needed in your estimate to get up to that most efficient fossil fuel number? Uh, uh, to be quite honest with you, I'm, I'm really unsure. Um, so replace the, the, the request would be, it, we would be off for, for cooling, we wouldn't be on any fossil fuels. Um, but that would only take care of the cooling season. 
but when we're heating, we still have uh, gas fired furnaces. They have been recently replaced and they are, are very, very efficient uh, boilers, uh, but we wouldn't completely eliminate um, the need for fossil fuels. Um, I, I really, I'm really not, not entirely sure. Um, if, if we were even to look at that, I'm sorry, Sean, I'll, I'll let you speak. If we were to look at that, I think it would be wise to, if, if at all possible, to leave the, the boilers in place, leave the heating loop in place. It provides redundancy. A lot can go wrong, as we're seeing in Texas, a lot can go wrong when you lose heat. When you lose cooling, you take off your shirt. <laughs> you know, but you, you, you can't lose heat because major issues will happen. Um, so to have that redundancy is, is, is very important. And I just wanted to quickly say, uh, Mandy Joe, I jotted that down um, so that we can get back to you with the information. Hopefully by the time we're done with presentations, we can bring back the question. So um, I just put down how much to get to the full VRF system. Or even VRF for chiller only, because I don't know, I'm still unsure whether that 400,000 would cover VRF for chiller. Okay. Yeah, we'll bring back more, uh, more information on that one. Tammy. Yeah, Tammy. Yeah, um, I'd just like to address the town hall security. I mean, you showed external doors with keypads. I mean, as if you're going to keep the public out. I'm a little concerned. I mean, pre-COVID, that building, I went in there multiple times a week for, for meetings in different rooms and going to the town clerk's office, people paying bills. So I was a little concerned. It was like you're going to armor it and nobody's going to be able to come in except unless you give them a badge. So... <laughs> That is just a little concerning to me. That's, you know, I'm sure that, that you're, <laughs> there's some way the public can get in. Oh, absolutely. And what the, what the system will, will offer, if we were able to put the building access system on those exterior doors, what it would allow for me to do is, is, is to program schedule for that door. So at 8 a.m., say town hall is open to the public from 8 a.m. in, in normal pre post pre-COVID uh, times uh, is say it's open or 8, 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. Uh, and then it's going to close, services are going to close up at, at 6 p.m. So I can schedule that Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. so that the doors will automatically open up and then they'll automatically lock after 6 p.m. If we were to have uh, a meeting that, that was later than that or it, I could program that as a special event and just say from seven o'clock to nine o'clock, there's going to be a, a, a JCP meeting and, and then allow people in that way as well. So then seven, it's open, 9 p.m. It's, it's relocked. So it just adds even more flexibility, more control. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to give a quick five minute warning um, before we switch over and what we can do is we can take questions if there's other questions like I said and we can um, get the responses back to everybody. Yeah I'm just looking around I had one uh, question on a, a different topic the two hundred thousand dollars which when I read it um, and then when you talked about it I said oh we're repairing walls we're repairing sidewalks we're repairing I mean it was a big list and then I looked at the five-year spread and you've got about 500,000 going over the five years so have you put together a large task list with these kinds of pictures you've got and this amount for this year will get this so much of it done is that the way you know because it's a, an eclectic group of things that all goes together. I mean, it made sense that that would be, but so it's, it does become an amount of money that you're managing. And then you say, now we're gonna do that railing with the broken up thing. And now we're gonna go over here. Um, and then you've looked at over five years, we'll get almost all of it done or we'll get half of it done or. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I, will, I would have to say that some of that Rob and I have talked about, there's some things that I would like to see done uh, I know that uh, there, are, there are windows at town hall that need to be addressed, particularly on the ground level. 
like Munson for the hall, there's the large windows that need to be got, taken care of. So I do have these sort of buckets of money that I'd like to, or, or thinking about these projects that would need a, this, uh, like a bucket of money, uh, but how much uh, it is yet to, some of them I do have some rough estimates for um, uh, prior to me coming aboard. I know um, one of the inspectors that did a, a, a lot of work looking at Munson. Uh, so there's a number of projects over there. Uh, so having the heating system, but we're also looking at, at uh, making the building itself more, more energy efficient with, with uh, looking at windows and lighting and, and um, uh, fans and insulation. So, so yes, in, in, a, in a way to answer your question, yes, I, I have been thinking about these different projects, but do I have um, a concrete list uh, that's something that's being developed, uh, trying to, to understand what are, what are the priorities that's going to fall into the, that money and how, how are we going to address it over the, the years? I think it's a great, I didn't mean to challenge it because I think it's getting at, we've talked at the council that we need to be maintaining things. So not wait till it falls apart or till I looked at that little sidewalk thing till someone's foot goes through the hole and they fall over, <laughs> they fall over, you know, that we'd like to avoid the disaster. And so yeah. I think, I think having that to-do list with a pot of money is great. And just as it, so what you're saying is you will be able to firm it up as you start to get a, a sense of how the work progresses, I think, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank Paul, you. Hand up. Okay, Paul. I know you're gonna go to the next topic, but I mean, I, I would really wanna thank uh, Jeremiah for the level of detail that you gave. Yeah more detail than you probably wanted, um, but <laughs> that's the kind of guy he is. Um, but also we're trying to be responsive both on, on, the, on the carbon neutral, uh, you know, our, our energy goals and um, trying to maintain the facilities like the council has talked about by saying, we're going to start budgeting money for these things so they don't big, get into bigger things. And, you know, we're not, we don't wanna be like showing you all every little thing, but we need Jeremiah to sort of use his his uh, knowledge to say this needs to be fixed this year. Yep. Well, thank you. Uh, Peter. Um, so if, if you had to cut $50,000 from something, where would you, and you were forced to do it, what would you pick? Um, I, I would pick someone else's money if I could. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm yeah. What is DPW for asking for? Her? <laughs> no, I, I, the only I, reason I, I asked... Guilford's not on here, is he? <laughs> if it's okay to continue, Kathy. I, the only reason I ask is that, you know, it, for any department that has a large expenditure, I'm gonna, I, I want to ask the same question um, because, you know, this is all about, you know, I don't see our committee making, you know, multi-million dollar recommendation changes one way or another, but, you know, it's all about the margins and and it's obviously a very difficult year where we would much rather fund capital at a, at a higher level than we're at, obviously. Um, and so, you know, we have to make some kind of uh, recommendation. Yeah, I, I would, I would ha have to hope that maybe in one of the areas if where we're looking at the um, uh, police department's chiller, again, the, the 400 is, is sort of just a, it's in, in some ways it's a guesstimate. And, and I certainly know that it could be more, uh, but depending on what we choose and how it is engineered, could it come under? And that would provide some of that relief uh, that you would be looking for. Um, but it is, it is hard. I, I know I tried not to ask for a lot, but unfortunately in, in my, my area, un, the projects just can get very costly. So Kathy, maybe do one no. more question. Okay, I'm looking to see if there's a uh, hand up. Okay, and Andy? Yeah, sort of uh, following up on the question that was just uh, asked. And uh, it, I guess the question is, as you looked at the um, needs and you were trying to put together your own priorities, what came higher was it personal safety? Was it what would uh, provide integrity for buildings um, and uh, avoid deterioration for the longest period of time? Uh, 
you know, what kinds of criteria did, did you apply? I, I would have to say that, you know, looking at some of the requests that were already in, um, I, I did have, feel that some shuffling needed to be done. Um, and that's, that's where I had, had asked Sean if we could move the roof of APD out two years and, and switch that with the chiller. Um, I don't know that we have two years with the chiller. I, if, if push comes to shove, I will, I'm probably could get it to, to, to last that, that long if need be. Uh, but, but then after, after looking at some of those, those critical need areas, it is, like you said, it is to prevent the deterioration of these buildings. We do have a number of buildings that, that, are, that are old. Uh, and, and it's so important to, to maintain those buildings because a little, uh, just a little bit can go a long way. We looked at the repointing is one of the areas that I, that I, uh, I highlighted in, in my presentation. Just having that, uh, an issue like that leads to bigger, more challenging issues. A little bit of water getting in deteriorates the brick. And that water also gets inside and deteriorates the, those internal finishes. So when we're, when now we're looking at both interior and exterior repairs that are needed. So if we, we can keep these, our buildings dry, we can keep them tight, our roofs are in good shape, then we can fix all of the things inside. So if we have a good roof, we have good walls, we have a good foundation, everything inside that we, we, can, we can work with. Uh, but it's so important to maintain that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Mandy Scott. Agreed. I have questions on future ones. So can I just mention them for maybe future consideration? They're yeah, very recent. I'll write them down, Mandy, as you yeah. mentioned. The Munson and Town Hall had repointing on them in the next couple of years. I would just ask if we can consider them as CPA requests. I think we've done that in the past or something. Um, I, I just don't know. Um, as, as we talk about moving as many things to CPA request as qualify. And then with the child care facility, can we really convert something to natural gas or are we still on a moratorium? It's just a random question um, that struck me as I thought we were on a moratorium. So how are we planning for a conversion to natural gas? Yeah, I, I will have to look into that and I could get back to you. Yep. They're future years, so they're not important right now. So, okay. I think, I think we just got through Jeremiah's list. Correct. I'm yeah. not. I'm not seeing any other hands up. All right. Do you want me to introduce the next um, yep. speaker? Yes. Thank you. It was. I actually love the pictures. So thank you. <laughs> Yep. Thank you, Jeremiah. Um, so the next uh, next department is the finance department in the assessor's office. And this is a little bit different of a capital request because it's not uh, sort of a tangible thing. It's a contract. Um, so Liz, do you want to introduce your um, project? Liz is our um, assessor. And she has to unmute. There we go. Can you hear me okay? I got my Princess Leia's ears on. Um, well, I think the easiest way for me to, to do this is to you know, present a couple of things. The, uh, the contractor we're talking about is a cyclical revaluation program that inspects, measures, and lists all the buildings in town. Um, we have 7,311 buildings or parcels in town. And um, we have approximately 6742 are taxable. Uh, the office has inspected 1940 uh, or about 30%. The uh, total that we really need to get inspected is about 4,800. So I gave you a couple of scenarios. I'm recommending uh, approximately 110,000, but I gave a couple of scenarios so you could see what I've got for estimates and what it would do for us. So I am going to share my screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Is it shared, I hope? Nope, there nope. it is. 
There we go. Is that better? Yep. Thank okay. You. So what you're looking at here is a couple of breakdowns. Now we're gonna process it over a three year period. In the past, we've budgeted $40,000 a year. $40,000 a year will give us for a three year period, 4,800 parcels. And that is our target. If we had to do all the parcels in town, that was 7311, that's including the exempt parcels, um, that would have been 182,000. But the office has conducted uh, almost 30% or uh, 1,942, you can see to the far right. So my suggestion is to, um, to keep on budgeting the 40,000. I will put out a request for bid. I did actually get an estimate from our existing vendor um, his name is Roy Bishop and Bishop of Bishop and Associates has served the town of Amherst for quite a few years and uh, they've maintained the same rates. But for a uh, capital expenditure of this amount, it would be prudent to do an RFP, request for proposal. Are there any questions? So let me look at the hands um, pictures Questions? Um, maybe take down your screen, Liz, unless people need, need it. And could we get that um, as part of our documents, Sean? Yes, sir, I, you sure can. Yeah, thank you. So if we unshare the screen, um, then I can see whether there are any questions. Any hands up? Mandy. I'm just going to ask a very basic one, which is what is a what is a cyclical valuation program like? What are you doing on these parcels? <laughs> okay, um, we measure and list the parcels. Basically, um, what we'll send out first is a data mailer that's going to have all the information or the basic information about each structure in town. We send them out to each owner of the property. At that point, that owner will have that opportunity to notify us if the information is inaccurate or it is accurate. When we see anomalies, we'll go out to those anomalies. Any sales that have happened during the inspection process, that's usually a two year period, we go to every sale of those properties. Um, I'd like to try and spend a little more time on the tax exempt properties, which has been a neglected area. And that's not uncommon. Honestly, every community does because like you know, we're all working with very limited budgets and you're being very prudent with your taxpayer dollars. So. Um, the tax exempts tend to be a little bit neglected. However, um, in recent years, we've determined, um, especially in tax exempts, you can usually find some nuggets of, of taxable or perhaps enhancement what we can bring out of it. So it's not a loss to actually um, do a good inventory of the community to make sure that all the T's are crossed and all the, the I's are dotted. So everybody equalizes that burden of tax. Thank you. And and so, Mandy, just to add to that, there's a, a state requirement that every so many years you have to get to the to these properties. And so it's five years now, Liz, every five years you have to hit all the properties. That's correct. Last revaluation here was in 2018. So the next so one will be in 2023? 20, January 2023 is when we have to establish the value. So we'll be looking at the sales from 22 and 21 to establish the 2023 value. And I just, so when you're talking about tax exempts, are we also talking about college and university or is it churches? Um, all tax exempt. All tax exempt, so it would be- All tax exempt, so that would be churches, that would be colleges, that would be uh, civic organizations perhaps that act in a charitable function, like the survival mm -hmm. center or, uh, something of that nature. So in your 7,311 buildings, does that count all the UMass buildings? That's everything. But well, I got a feeling I may be shy of you. No, I just, I mean, they, they I, ac I, according to my statistics, they have over 400 buildings and we only got 149,000 back in grants. What's yeah. wrong with that figure? And Liz, the, that's parcels, right? The 7,000 is, that's a parcel number? That, that is the number of accounts. Okay. That's per account. We're charged per account when it comes to uh, doing revaluation services. And of course, um, we in the assessor's office are going to do our very best to get as many done as possible to reduce that over 
um, that overall cost to the community. Um, the previous assessor was successful in doing that and he was able to encumber funds um, that went towards this year's uh, interim revaluation expenses and, ex and so forth. So uh, we would like to keep that trend going. Um, we were able to keep our keep under budget this year and uh, I'm real proud of our, 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 our crew here. We work real hard to try to stretch every dollar for you all so that we can uh, be worth our, we worth our pay. <laughs> So any other questions? Uh, the only other thing, I don't think it, that you're not looking at operational budget budgets tonight, correct? No, you're no, only, just, you're, that, just that one yeah. request. Yeah, so that's that's all I have to share with you tonight. Thank you, every, thank you very much. You know, I'm just thinking of when our, what, what our old farmhouse is on your books, what you have as content. So we'll, I guess we'll see. Well, usually when I do this process, some of the first people I share the new numbers with are people like you. So <laughs> it tends to have a, a greater impact on the audience when you're looking at your own properties. It's a little more meaningful. And that way, you know, you can see the impact it will have on the outer community. So tends to keep you from glazing over when I talk talk yeah. assessments. So, I, you know, it's not a thrilling job, but it's an important job I, I really enjoy doing for you. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. So Will that be all? Yep. Yes. Yep. Thank you and good night, everyone. Good night. And I'll send that form to you to share with them, okay? Great. So our next speaker I was going to go to Doug because he's quick. He's just got, Doug, are you doing the copiers or is Jerry doing the copiers? I'll do the copiers. Okay. So, sorry, Jerry and Sean. <laughs> no, it's really brief. Uh, basically, uh, as described in the, in the draft of the joint capital planning uh, document, we didn't do any uh, copiers this last year. They, they typically last about five years. We have a number of them throughout the district. Um, you know, once we get beyond five years, the number of copies uh, accumulates to a point where the, the repair of them and the, and the warranties on them get expensive and then the number of repairs go up. And so it becomes cost effective to, to replace them. Uh, we have two slated uh, for, re for replacement, uh, which were, te you know, technically on last year's JCPC. And obviously we've used the copiers less. I mean, we still use them, but, but they, they're less. Um, they are printer copiers. So, they, you know, we try to eliminate the number of printers we have. Um, there's one slated for Crocker Farm and one slated for, for Fort River. Uh, each of those machines gets on the order of half a million copies a year uh, to give you a sense of the, the workload that they take on. Um, the other thing that's in that uh, request for copiers is there's a very large, uh, I'd almost say commercial size uh, copying uh, machine at the high school uh, that we uh, you know, use to produce larger volume printing. Uh, more, you know, uh, bound documents, that sort of stuff. Um, and so uh, each of the districts helps contribute to buying that new machine. That's a, that machine's sort of base price is in the, I think, $40,000, $45,000 range. Um, so, you know, we're looking to replace that. That machine's gotten quite, uh, it's, I think, about eight years old, maybe a little older. Um, it's starting to, to show its age and break down often, and, and it's outside the window of, of being under warranty. So it it's a, it's a more expensive repair when we have those. Uh, so those are requests for copiers for the coming year. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, we've had low usage this year and a, and a good chunk of last year. Um, I, I will state this for the sake of, of, of um, you know, I know that you have things that you have to trim out of your, your joint capital planning budget generally. Um, there's a little wiggle room on this, I would say. These have, you know, relative to some of the other things you'll hear from the schools, um, you know, these are, are an area where if, if push comes to shove, um, a little trimming can be done and we can, we can tolerate that. Um, and again, I think that's largely because our, our usage has been so low over the last uh, year and a half. So I think I'll stop there and answer any questions anyone has about the exciting topic of copiers. So looking around, Mandy. Is this just the copiers or also the tech equipment portion for schools that we're asking? This is just copiers right now. You, you'll then hear more on the other in a minute. I didn't have any questions. I actually remembered this presentation before we shut down Capitol last year. <laughs> but, yeah. 
So I'm not seeing any hands up. So I think we could move on to the next then. So I, I feel divided loyalties choosing between Jerry and Sean on this one. I feel like they should do rock, paper, scissors or something to decide who goes next. Whoever turns their screen on first gets to go, oh, Jerry. Uh, Sean, Jerry's gone. <laughs> I can control Zoom, so I could probably uh, give Jerry the boot. Uh, Jerry's, Jerry's more than welcome to go first if uh, you'd rather. All the same to me. I think Jerry's is a little bit quicker, so I don't know. Okay. Oh, well, now, now the pressure's on. Exactly. And, and I was going to talk, you know, comment on Sean's dollhouse and how, how pretty it is. <laughs> but, anyways. So um, I spent a lot of time recently um, going over um, the devices and, and the figures I had submitted back in the fall. Um, as you all know, it's been a very atypical school year for us. Um, and what that's caused is kind of a shift in, in the priorities and, and, and the expenditures. Um, you know, when we shut down in March, we were all of a sudden faced with handing out, you know, several thousand, a couple thousand devices to, to families to support and stuff. And what it also caused is less wear and tear on some of the other equipment we have in, in position. So looking at that and looking at expenditures and what we didn't spend because we were shut down for the last year and stuff. Uh, today, I've been able to kind of reallocate some funds and cut some funds entirely. So if you look at the, uh, the, the requests that I had submitted um, back in the fall, there were a couple items that, that have seen some major changes. So the, the big one, um, is projectors. Um, since they haven't been used in a year, we haven't seen the, the, the attrition that we, we expected, especially given the age of many of them. And the other um, big change that's affecting this is the reconfiguration of the quads at uh, Fort River and Wildwood, moving from basically four classrooms to two in each of the quads. Each classroom previously had a projector, so we technically have some spares if, if need be. So that 28,600 I've zeroed out. So you can right away take that and zero that out. Uh, one thing that has changed and, and has gone up and kind of offsetting that is the switches. Um, and the switches will also tie into the wireless line. So the wireless line I've reduced from 55,000 down to $30,000. Okay, in the switch line, we've moved from 10,000 up to $40,000. Um, the reason for this are, are multiple. Um, as far as the switches goes, one of the things we do have to do is the town fiber um, starts coming in, into, uh, place, we need to upgrade um, all the core switches that will allow us to connect to that fiber. So th there's monies in there to support that. Um, we have also been able to um, look at um, implementing one-to-one -one Chromebooks from first through sixth grade, where previously we had third through sixth grade. Um, but what this is causing is an increased um, load and reliance on the wireless. So we are looking to increase um, the capacity of, of our wireless network to be able to better handle um, the, the additional load. Um, and you say, but you went down from 55 to 30 because that's because the equipment has become better, more efficient and, and more cost effective. So um, looking at the, the requests now as they stand, the top line um, stays pretty much as I submitted for 120,000 and that's to replace um, most of the, um, of that is for uh, computers, okay? Um, the staff uh, laptops, when we purchased them a few years ago, were off lease then 
So they've aged since then. So we're looking at replacing a lot of the um, older staff laptops. I did a, an inventory today and if I can find it, we're looking at about 110 laptops that are aged out and should need to be replaced. And they run about $1,000 a piece by the time you get the laptop and the warranty. Um, the monitors will, will, will still keep in there and even though they're using laptops because a lot of people still use monitors, uh, libraries, labs and such. And we still have some older, smaller LCD monitors. So the 1500 will basically cover about 10 to 12 monitors. Um, the switches, as we said, the 40,000, which um, it sounds like a lot, but it doesn't go as far as you might think. Um, some of our core switches run upwards of $24,000. So that's going to handle um, what we need to do right now to connect to the uh, fiber and to replace some of the other closet switches. Uh, UPS, I uh, left that in there at 3,000. The wireless, as I said, goes from 55 to 30,000. Um, I've zeroed out the multimedia equipment line as well. So that pretty much the entire request. Jerry, can I just ask is the, what's the final number for FY22 that's being proposed? Okay, let me just change back to that. Just so I can make sure if I need to update. Uh, 194,500. 194,500? Correct. Okay. Um, we also just got today from Doug um, some of the capital balances. Um, as, as Sean well knows, that I don't have access to those. So it's always kind of a little bit of guesswork to see where I stand. Um, the, another variable which may affect things going forward too is we submitted um, some of our purchases under the CARES Act. And until we, I hear back or we know back, I haven't heard uh, whether that is being uh, supported by the CARES Act, uh, we'll know if we have anything else. Questions? Alex? I just want to clarify that I heard your last statement right. So funds that you've, things that you've submitted under CARES Act, if they're declined, will be added to the budget or the current budget might be decreased if they're accepted? If they're accepted, that would have, that means that some of the funds that we, we have booked against capital purchases may become available again so that we'd okay. be able to decrease, not increase. Okay. That's what I was making sure. I, I thought I heard it one way and then I was like, wait, did I? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And Kathy, can I just clarify one thing real quick? Yep. Yep. Um, so, and, and maybe this was a miscommunication on my part. Um, so if people look back at the capital plan, we had pushed FY21 out. So the number in the capital plan is 148,000. So we'll update that with the new figure that Jerry just um, stated of, I think it was 194,000. Yeah, because it was, there wasn't a match. So thank you for catching that, yeah. Okay, sorry. I only had the, um, what I had submitted, which had the the FY22 as as you were looking yeah, at. Not, it, so. Yeah, like I said, it might, it might have been on my part. So I apologize. Uh, my And in terms of the CARES Act, if at what point, so Peter's question of if you had to give up 50, but at what point would we know whether a part of this 194 is covered from another source or could be covered? Will we know that like in the next month? Um, just on when you're gonna come to us with a, a balance sheet for this year. Any sense? Right. I, I don't know. I defer to Doug and Sean yeah, on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just. I was... Yeah. So I think, uh, and Doug can jump in on this too. Um, he can talk about the school CARES money. So there's lots of CARES 
buckets right now. There's a big bucket on the municipal side, and I think there's two or three buckets on the school side. Um, on the town side right now, we're waiting to hear back from FEMA as to what they are going to cover. And that will dictate how much CARES money we have available because FEMA is the, the first funding source and CARES is the backup if FEMA doesn't cover it. The problem is it's FEMA and they're really slow normally. And then you have every community in the, the country applying to FEMA. And so it, it makes it even, even a slower process. So we've submitted two FEMA requests and we haven't heard back on either of them yet. And then to complicate matters more, this is sort of like an accountant's worst nightmare. They keep changing the rules for these grant programs and Doug can attest to that. Um, so FEMA originally was going to reimburse 75% of eligible costs. They've now changed that to they're gonna reimburse 100% and they're changing the eligibility a little bit. And so it's quite possible, as Jerry said, that there will be more CARES money that we can use to potentially cover some of the some of those IT costs um, that fall into eligible buckets. We're just we're trying to be prudent and wait to find out that we've gotten FEMA money first before we start spending more CARES money um, beyond what we already have. Thank you, Mandy. You had said you had a question on this. Yeah, Andy had his hand up first. Okay, oh, Andy, Andy has Andy. Andy, go ahead. Oh, okay. I, see, I see the little blue hands are up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so look, looking at this number, I've heard for a couple months now that many new IT and laptops and all were, were purchased last spring and that that would be able to sort of decrease the required purchases for this year and next year for tech for students. Yet in the presentation, it sounds like that's not happening. So I guess where is, it, are we just, what, I guess I, I'm confused and I'm, I'm not matching those statements together. You know, it, is what we purchased for schools and students because of COVID decreasing how much tech we need to purchase for the next couple of years because we sort of pre-purchased everything to be able to cover more students or has the school policy changed so that we're not we're not going back to which students used to have tech we're permanently expanding what students have tech so that we now have more laptops to replace every year i i hope that was kind of clear <laughs> so those funds, none of those are for student devices, okay? So we were able to use the, the CARES money or whatever money that were made available to replace or augment devices for, for this year, which will cover us for the next few years. So to explain on Chromebooks again, Chromebooks have a finite life. And when I say that, it's not because they just die or whatever, but Google stops supporting them for updates. So we have currently, and this is K-12, uh, 1,336 Chromebooks that are going out of support this year as of September, 2021. Of those about 712 are Amherst devices. So we were able to purchase enough devices to cover all of those that are going out of update support, but it also is allowing us to have one-to-one, -one, one through six, so we won't have shared devices. Now we know that, you know, when we first started going down this path, the, the science wasn't in about uh, surfaces and the transmission of, of COVID on surfaces. Obviously, we know now that that's not as, as, as um, transmissible as it was, but we'd still like to keep things where students are sharing as few things as possible. Okay, and if you saw the way these come in, these devices, you would say, well, it's a good thing we're not sharing them anyways, because uh, it's like Jackson Pollock painting as far as the screens and the keyboards um, in, in, at times. So we, we got one in today um, that had milk spilled in it, for example and it reeks and it's not salvageable. So we've, we've had a lot of attrition, unfortunately, this year. We've repaired what we, we can, but a lot of them, because they were older and going out anyways, we're just not repairing. 
So none of the, this money is for student devices. However, indirectly, it is to support student devices as we have to look at, or we want to look at increasing the, the wireless. It, the coverage is good, but the, the capacity could be improved. In other words, when you have every classroom with every student on devices, then we need to have the, to be able to support that capacity. Um, whether how the MCAS testing falls and who's going to be in the school is still up in the air, but that's this year. Um, next year, you know, we are likely going to be doing high stakes testing. And when we do it, it's the entire grade at once. When we do it at the high school, it's every student that's taking MCAS is doing it at once. I know this is, we're talking Amherst, but that's just when I talk about capacity is being able to support that volume all at one time. So the 120,000 for computer, laptop, tablet replacements is not a single student. Those are not, the, this, this coming year is not for students. That's strictly staff laptops. Um, as I said, over the years, you know, we, we've done uh, different purchases of staff laptops for the elementary teachers. Um, but for the last three or four years, we've been using off lease because we didn't have enough money to do new. So the off lease ones are less expensive, but they're already a couple of years old. So that's kind of catching up to us and we, we need to look at replacing some of them. And as you may know, laptops don't age as well as desktops do. Um, they're all you know, running the solid state hard drives now. So, so we can't kind of increase their lifespan by throwing those in the way we used to with some of the old ones. So, Thank you. Um, and we also had to purchase a lot of iPads for kindergarten students. So we have those, we don't have to do them, purchase them now, although some are aging out. And it's the same way with Apple. They just stop supporting older devices and we can't upgrade them. We've had problems with um, some of the older iPads because they were stuck at a version of the operating system that didn't allow, allow the newer versions to say Google Meet. We use Google and, and you know, to, to install. So that caused problems with some of the, the devices. So it's really just trying to support the, the, the current software and, and, and apps that they use. But again, none of this is for that. This is for the teachers. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, actually, um, I think some of what you just said in response to Mandy responds to what I was thinking as I had raised my hand originally. So um, what I had, what I've been hearing was that you were doing a lot of reaction to adjusting to needs of the current year as opposed to uh, needs of the year ahead uh, when we anticipate finally getting back into actually teaching in schools. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, future planning is going in the direction we wanted to. And I think the answer is a little bit there. No, yeah. I think we're actually in very good position. We started reacting to the situation last March. Um, and as some of you may or may not know, the um, Chromebook supplies were dried up overnight. So an order I put in in June didn't arrive until mid-December, for example. But fortunately, working with the suppliers I worked with, we were able to get the devices we needed to support students. And now these devices are good until the bulk of them until June of 2026 and some of them until 2028. So we are, as far as student devices go, in, in a pretty good position going forward over the next few years. Peter. And just a little bit of context on some of the good questions that were asked. Um, I, I don't know if this is where any was going, but um, the the support of laptops for teachers that's in that's in a steady state, normal non pandemic time that teachers need laptops these days. This isn't um, this isn't laptops in anticipation of some remote model next year. I won't turn this into a school committee meeting. School committee has talked about the fall. Um, 
And uh, yeah, and the, the Chromebook thing was crazy. There was a, 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 a massive global ethics issue with the supply chain where, where those dried up. Um, so that, that's what happened there. Interesting story. No, we we, trend, we offered uh, laptops to elementary teachers many years ago. We're probably on our fourth iteration of devices at this point, third or fourth. So th that's not a reaction to the uh, the shutdown. Kim, I don't think I see any other hands. Um, so I think, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have Sean, the other Sean now, correct? Yeah. Yeah, the better well, looking Sean. <laughs> uh, I'm just happy that I don't have to uh, follow the fire department. I think my last three uh, capital hearings have been in in person and the fire department normally shows up with like demo equipment and everything. And I, <laughs> I always feel uh, a little inadequate. So, um, so similar to other years that do, I just run through what we, what we have on here. Um, yeah, just run through the, the four projects. Yeah. So we got four, four projects there. Um, most of them are um, pretty, be typical. Um, the first is the the biggest one, which is our infrastructure replacements, um, which is the 162.925, and that's um, our, our standard stuff that we replace on a schedule. It's 75 computers, a server, um, some network switches, some wireless access points, um, and you know, cleaning up some of the network cabling, some of the aged network cabling that's 10 plus years old, um, and replacing a few copiers. Um, so we've got that. We've got the document imaging, which is a um, something we've done in the past. Um, and this is kind of a continuation of it that we got a community compact grant to buy LaserFiche, which is a document management system to house all these documents that we've scanned over the years. So this would be sending out additional documents to get them scanned so we can load them into the, the laser fish system. Uh, the next thing we have is the MDTs, the um, basically the computers in the police cruisers. Um, those, those are, they will be five years old in May, four or five, uh, double check, four or five years old this, they'll be five years old next May. Um, and those get a lot of, um, those get a lot of wear and tear and they, um, they also, the temperature goes up and down in the vehicle and everything. So those we found in the past that if we try and stretch those out too far, they, they start failing, um, and they'll no longer be under warranty and it's, it's um, usually bad. And then the last is the library capital, which is a similar replacement schedule for them, which is some PCs, a printer, photocopier, um, a wireless access point, and a security camera. So I don't know if we... Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at hands because I had a couple questions when I was looking through this, but I'm, I'm letting others go first. So, well, I'll ask mine. It was actually on the smaller line on the library side, um, not for this year, but looking out several years. If uh, the uh, expansion project goes through and we're constructing a library and it's closed, would we continue to buy the equipment during those years or would we put that on hold? You know, so this is, it went out for each of several years. So it wasn't a question for, you know, I'm assuming we will be able to open the library up this year. So there's a line item, but I looked at it's, it's every single year is uh, buying and you describe what you would be buying. Yeah, so I, I can't answer that definitively, but what I can say is this, the, the numbers that are on there have been coordinated with, with Sharon at the library. So it, 
the numbers that are on there and the reason you see some of the fluctuation is based on their anticipated um, renovation. Um, so my understanding is the out year numbers on that are, are roughly correct. Um, and I think the anticipation is that they would, um, depending on how long the library would be closed, they would be buying equipment to go into the new library. Okay. You know, as I said, it's not, it's not directly affecting the year we're looking at. So I just mm -hmm. was curious about out years. Mandy. So I have a follow-up to that one and two others. My follow-up is, um, and this is probably, I don't know whether Sean, you can answer this or it, it needs to go to Sharon um, or whether one of the trustees can. Is IT infrastructure like what's on these requests, so computers and stuff for the library, something that's included in the soft costs of a of the MBLC program that we've seen numbers on such that they wouldn't need to be on the capital plan? Um, I just don't know, so I'm curious. Um, my other two questions are the scanning that you talked about. I noticed this is the last year on the five-year plan for that. Does that mean after this year, we're going to be done with the scanning that we needed to do? Um, and then the tech replacements, the number seems stable. So this is the similar question to what I asked on the school side, which is, um, did we buy a lot of tech for COVID? I, I, I believe we did. Did this number take that into consideration um, such that maybe we don't have to replace as much this year because, or next fiscal year, because this fiscal year and last fiscal year, we ended up buying a whole lot? Yeah, so um, I think to answer them in order, the, the library question, my understanding, and certainly somebody else probably knows this better, but my understanding is the MBLC money does not cover the computers um, in there. Um, that was my experience 14 years ago in Worcester, but um, so I don't, I don't know if anybody else has a definitive answer to that. But, um, and I can write that one down unless somebody else knows and just get, we'll come back with the, a definitive answer. Yeah, I, I would say that um, you're right that in, ter in terms of the eligibility for the grant from the MBLC, it's definitely not included. Um, there is a furniture fixture and equipment line um, that has a line for data equipment, telecommunications equipment, audiovisual equipment, book sorter, all of that stuff. But I don't know the detail level of that to know exactly how it breaks out. So. Um, that's about all I can give in terms of information. Um, and then on our other um, our other projects, so for the scanning, um, I can't say for sure if that will finish it off. But the idea is that that will the idea is that we take a lot of the old um, stuff we have in paper and scan that, and then the new system, like with the new permitting system. So much more of that is generated electronically and stored electronically that once we get through the backlog of all our historic stuff, um, then much of the new content is is digital to begin with. So it gets stored digitally. Um, and then the question as far as the equipment um, that we purchased with CARES, but um, the stuff, the the main stuff that we bought with CARES money was laptops, um, which we um, we deployed a lot of laptops to users to work from home. Um, and we frankly, at the time, we that was our only way of getting a webcam for people to, to Zoom uh, with. So, um, so those will those continue to be, to be used. They'll be redeployed, and um, in many cases, we'll end up using those as a desktop. Um, we'll give people a keyboard, mouse, and monitor. So certainly to, um, to the question of what, if we had to cut something, what we would cut. Um, and I would say the, um, the computer, the number of PCs that we would normally purchase, we could, we could reduce that. Um, we could certainly reduce that by, by 25 or, or 35. Um, we need, if we need to cut somewhere, that certainly would be a, a good place to start. 
Peter. Um, if, if you had another 50,000 more than you had, well, what's, what's the next thing you'd, you'd really like to do? Oh, so if we, um, so what, one of the things that we're, we're trying to focus on this year is, is just, um, reevaluating a lot of what we do in terms of security, um, cybersecurity. So we, um, that and and trying to use Microsoft, we use Microsoft um, Office 365 for our email, but we've been over with COVID and, and everything else. We've been um, with people working more re remotely. We've been doing a lot more with Teams and everything else. Um, so I would say I would say security and collaboration are kind of the two the two big things. Uh, I, the the big challenge with both of those are most of those are services. Um, so when we add something, if we added something there, then oftentimes it it increases the operating budget significantly. So that's we've been really cautious about what what we add. Um, Microsoft has some amazing stuff that if we turned it on for everybody, it would be fantastic, but our, our bill would go up quite a bit and Sean and Paul would probably be unhappy, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Andy's hand is up, Andy. Yeah. Just say real quick, you get blamed for everything when you're finance director. Yeah. You get blamed. Uh, on the school yeah. side, I was blamed for everything. On the town side. We never blamed you, yeah. Sean. What are you talking about? Just throwing it out there. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Sean Hannon, is the INET uh, running on budget? The INET so, yeah, so far it is as far as the installation. Um, so, so far it's, um, there's, there's a couple questions as far as where they have to go underground. Um, they haven't done that yet, but as far as um, as far as I've heard, with everything that they're putting on the poles and everything that's that's moving along, and and as it uh, they haven't run into anything unusual yet. When's the new projected finish deadline? Finish date for that? Um. I believe it's mid March. Um, there's it, it's a little unclear as far as I'm getting into buildings um, and um, some of the underground stuff they haven't been able to do yet just because the, the ground's frozen. Uh, it'd be good to have that done. Not seeing anything else. Well, I just want to compliment you and your staff because I think this switch to Zoom and managing the security technology on Zoom, but also po posting the the videos. Um, you know, for the first time, many committees can go back and watch them. You know, if someone wants to say, "Can I see something?" and I know your staff has been getting individual requests from people who missed a meeting that want to see it the next day and Surge has been, you've just been incredibly responsive and uh, uh, I don't know how, and I've known, seen you've redesigned some of the web design too, so that, um, thank you. you know, for Thanks. The service Thanks. To all. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. No, I, we're, we're incredibly lucky. We, we, we've made, we've had some staff changes over, over time. And, and I think that we just, uh, uh, luck or, or something else that we we kind of hit COVID at a time that we had um, that we've had fantastic staff who've been able to just jump in and been incredibly flexible and people who were hired to do one thing and expected to do one thing and the surge surge started um, I think January fifteenth um, and so it was just the with with everybody they they everybody has really stepped up and we um, so been incredibly lucky with that. So thank, thank you. Thank you all. So I'm, um, I'm, I need to check, double check to see if we have, have any public that wants to, there are no public attendees. Um, so there won't be any public requesting things. So I think we just got through tonight's agenda. 
and there are no unexpected issues. I, Sean has been adding, Sean, should, should we just automatically look in the packet? So are, is that, you know, so that you don't get all of our, where's the packet, where should we look? Um, yeah, so, so I put, um, so yeah, if you go to each meeting packet, the projects for that night are in that packet. Um, so they're, they're all in there now. So you can go out two meetings or the next meeting and you'll see the, the project write-ups. Okay, thank you for doing that. And I don't know the people who wanted to get the Excel sheets he did in a recent email attach Excel with all these uh, dollar lines going out. So those who wanted that information, we have it in our hands. So I think I, think, uh, I can say that the meeting is adjourned. Um, thank you all. Have a nice Friday and week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.